All right, here we go. Okay, so we're back at Cracks in Postmodernity with Bill Cavanaugh, who's a professor at DePaul University. And I first discovered your work through Torture and Eucharist. Um, the title is lovely, very exciting. Um, <laughs> but so the, I was really fascinated by a lot of the ideas you were talking about there. Um, and then I discovered next the myth of religious violence in which you talk about this kind of thesis about secularism. So let's start there. What, what uh, can you summarize some of the main ideas in the myth of religious violence? Sure. I, I, I had a friend who was a priest who once told me that torture and Eucharist are the two principal parts of the mass. First, there's the homily, which is torture, and then comes Eucharist. That makes sense. Um, and that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So the myth of religious violence, um, that's another title that's meant to be a little provocative. A lot of people hear it and think, you know, the myth of the spherical earth or something that I'm a flat earther and I'm denying what's obviously true. Um, but the argument of the book is not that people don't kill for, uh, you know, Christianity and Islam and Judaism and so on. Uh, the argument is that there's nothing essentially different about killing uh, on behalf of a god and killing on behalf of a nation state or oil or freedom or the flag or all of the other things that people kill for. Um, people treat all sorts of things as if they were ultimates. And so this distinction between the religious and the secular, I kind of do a genealogy of that and show how it's a modern Western distinction that mm -hmm. most people throughout most of the world, throughout most of history, uh, just don't have. They don't have this kind of separation of religious things from the rest of, of life. And so um, the argument of the book is that people kill for all sorts of things. Um, if you ask, for example, who's killed more people over the last hundred years, um, atheists or Muslims, the answer is atheists, and it's not really even close, right? Um, Estimates range from 70 to 110 million that were killed under Marxist uh, regimes. And so it kind of levels the playing field. There aren't these kind of, you know, religious people who believe ridiculous things and kill people because of it. Uh, and then kind of sane secular people uh, who kill for more, you know, sensible reasons. Um, it's much more complicated than that. And so you level the playing field. Uh, between so-called believers and non-believers by pointing out that everybody believes in something, right? Don't tell me uh, I'm a believer and you're a non-believer. Just tell me what you believe in and I'll tell you what I believe in and then we can have a, a conversation. So no one is truly secular then if we all believe in something. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the novelist David Foster Wallace in that famous uh, commencement address to Kenyon College he gave in 2005 said uh, in the actual everyday trenches of everyday life there's no such thing as atheists everybody worships the only question is um, what do you worship mm -hmm. and he says the only reason you might want to worship a god or some other kind of spiritual thing is that everything else you worship will eat you alive and so if you worship uh, your looks you will never be good looking enough. If you worship money, you'll never have enough uh, and so on. Um, and so in some ways, that's what I'm uh, trying to work out in that book uh, and, and in the one that I'm writing right now on mm -hmm. idolatry. But if that's the case, then where does this whole idea of secularism, like how, do, how is this constructed then? It's constructed in the early modern period in Europe. Uh, in basically in the battle between um, church authorities and uh, civil authorities. So the modern nation state, so they, this is a, a battle that goes back centuries for power in Europe, you know, civil authorities versus ecclesiastical authorities. And one or the other has the upper hand in different periods until it's finally resolved uh, in the early modern period with the rise of the nation state and the civil authorities get the upper hand kind of once and for all. And so 
what um, the ecclesiastical authorities are left with is something called religion, which is something which is essentially private and separate from uh, the business of running the government and the army and, and, and businesses and so on. And then um, that distinction between religious and secular gets exported to the rest of the world in the process of colonization. And it's very useful for the European colonizers because it's a way of taking everything it means to be Indian, for example, uh, labeling it Hinduism, calling it a religion, and therefore uh, to be Indian is to be private and to be British is to be public. Interesting. So I want to go now to this article that you published with Common Wheel about Amazon and idolatry. So you talk a lot about Max Weber and his kind of thesis of disenchantment. So for those who are unfamiliar, can you just explain briefly what is Weber trying to say and how do you incorporate that into your thesis? Sure. So Max Weber, um, famous German sociologist, probably the most famous sociologist, died in 1920. And um, he's known for putting forth this idea of that the modern world is disenchanted. So uh, the world used to be enchanted with gods and fairies and saints and angels and so on. And um, science, but mostly capitalism, has kind of de disenchanted the world and left us with the, the iron cage of modernity. Um, in his famous uh, phrase. And so we're kind of left, he was very melancholy about this. He was not a believer in God, um, but he thought that something kind of had been, had been lost uh, in the meantime. And so um, uh, we live in this disenchanted world. His, his word is entzauberon, which uh, it, it literally in German means the kind of demagicking of the world, Salber means magic, um, and it's was it's been translated as disenchantment. So that's the way people usually read uh, Weber. And so I go back. Uh, this is actually the first chapter of this book I'm writing now, and look at Weber. And I think he's not so sure about this. Um, he talks about um, he so he says many old gods rise from their grave and take the form of impersonal forces. And he talks in many places about the kind of rule of capital, not, not capitalists, but capital um, and the state and bureaucracy um, over people's lives. And so he kind of has this way of thinking uh, that we create the, we may have vanquished the old gods through this process of rationalization but now we're left then with this kind of um, arbitrary choice of values um, because science can't answer the question of what really matters in life and values. And so you just have to make this kind of arbitrary leap of faith and choose one. And um, you choose amongst the gods, uh, but there are some gods that have just been imposed upon us and, and we, um, we have no choice. So he has this kind of um, uh, idea that we've just been entrapped. We, we uh, are subject to, we're dominated by the forces of our own creation. You know, we never, there, he doesn't believe there ever were any gods or fairies or angels and so on. But he thinks that capital and the modern state and bureaucracy are basically the same kinds of things that we create uh, these systems and then uh, become dominated by them, just like Frankenstein. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. the Frankenstein monster says, um, uh, you know, um, you are my creator, but, but you must obey me. Uh, and so, um, so Marx thought that once we figured out that the gods were made up, uh, then we'd, be, we'd throw them off and we'd all be free. But Weber, I think, thought that we're just kind of, we, we are fated to be subject to other gods of our own making. So, so he doesn't believe that we're disenchanted, in other words. He believes that there are many old gods mm -hmm. uh, which rise from their graves and, uh, and rule over us. So the, the title of my book is going to be Many Old Gods. 
uh, in honor of old Max Weber. So, um, so even Weber doesn't really believe that, that we've been disenchanted. Okay, so while Weber and Marx may not agree on this point, um, you do incorporate Marx's idea of fetishism that I guess he thinks capitalism breeds. So what is this fetishism and how do you see it um, coming up in the way that we, the way that brands market themselves, sell themselves to consumers today? Right, so Marx in the first volume of Capital has this idea of commodity fetishism. Mm -hmm. um, and a fetish is uh, basically something, an inanimate object that is endowed with magical powers by, uh, by people, right? People kind of attribute um, all kinds of powers to uh, a, a material object. And so he thinks that this is uh, endemic to capitalism. It's not just an accidental feature where some people are greedy and materialist and put too much importance on material things. It's rather that um, uh, in the market, things uh, go into the market and uh, begin to interact with one another uh, and kind of take on, <clears throat> take on life while at the same time, uh, life is being drained away from the workers. And so, um, uh, and he, he was writing this long before um, the advent of mass advertising, uh, before the advent of brands. And it's all uh, very kind of clear to see in, in the development of those things into the you know, late 19th into the 20th and 21st centuries. So um, the idea that, um, well, brands, for example, right? There were, it used to be, you, you didn't have brands. You went to the store and if, if you did go to the store, most of the stuff that people had, they made for themselves. But if you go to the store in the early 19th century or, you know, the storekeeper is, fishing um, pickles out of barrels and, um, and you buy a shirt or a chair uh, or you know, other sort of commodities and they don't have names to them. So brands originally, uh, I think tobacco companies and patent medicine sellers in the 19th century are the first to use brands. And it comes from this idea of branding uh, a, a big wooden box of tobacco uh, on it. Um, so patent medicines, uh, which are basically just hokum and tobacco, uh, it's, it's interesting that, that brands kind of originate with that. And so that by the 1880s, then you've got the Quaker Oats Man, kind of one of the first successful brands and, and products become animated. And, uh, and this then, of course, just takes flight uh, into the 20th century, the animation of products. And a lot of scholars think that um, products become personified uh, as the economy gets depersonalized, right? So once you um, uh, no longer know the, your local storekeeper or no longer know the person that has made your products, then the whole process becomes depersonalized and, and that personality then has to be attributed to, um, to the actual material objects that you interact with because you don't really interact with people. And, and something like Amazon, you know, online shopping has taken that to a whole new level so that um, you go on amazon.com and you don't see any people, there are no people. Uh, it's just products. And so you interact, you establish these relationships with products, and then you click on something, and then it magically appears on your doorstep a couple days later, and there, you've had no interaction with any human beings at all. Your only interactions are with uh, the product. And so the Amazon package has a smile on it, and the packages sing and dance in the commercials, and the garage doors talk to one another and they have faces. Uh, and the people working in the Amazon warehouse don't have uh, faces. So this, this 
process of the animation of products, there's a whole uh, bunch of uh, literature and studies that have been done on animism and anthropomorphism uh, and personification uh, of products. And you can see it, you know, why does my baloney have a first name? If you remember the, the ad from yeah. the 1970s, my baloney has a first name, it's O-S-C-A-R, my baloney has a second name. Why does your baloney have a name? Well, because <laughs> the people that make it and bring it to you don't have names, right, or faces. Uh, and this accelerates once manufacturing gets mostly sent uh, overseas, uh, you know, the whole process of globalization. So we relate to products and we don't um, have relationships with people. And that's the kind of economy uh, that we live in. Yeah, I think it's interesting on one hand, how a lot of us as consumers will like wrap up our identity with whatever it is we're consuming. Um, so for example, like I see with a lot of young people that I work with, they are very obsessed with the the Supreme brand. Have you ever seen it's like the red label and it just says Supreme and that's it. It's like a bunch <laughs> of celebrities. Like people will pay $200 for a white t-shirt with this logo on it. And it's just a white t-shirt, but you know, they saw Kanye wearing it or J. Cole was wearing it. So I have to have it now because if I have it now I'm on their status, you know? So it's like, I mean, it's what you say, it's this idolatry of, you know, some kind of ideal, which isn't actually substantial or like, yeah, like not, not just with products though, but even with, I see that, especially with entertainers too. Like a lot of people who are fans of a particular musician, like now they take on an identity, like fans of Lady Gaga, they're the little monsters or like Beyonce fans are in the Bay Hive. So it's like my, who I am is wrapped up in what I'm consuming, what I'm listening to. It, it's interesting. Right. Yeah, that, that is really interesting. There's a, there's a book called The Culting of Brands, which mm. kind of traces this and, um, uh, and argues that basically brands are like cults. Yeah. Uh, the author uh, presents it in a kind of non-pejorative way, but it's, a, it, it's an attempt to belong uh, to something. It's something that one puts one's aspirations and identity into. And the author, uh, Douglas Atkin, talks about how this is kind of corporations have kind of replaced traditional uh, religions in providing these kind of uh, vehicles for, for meaning. Uh, and the interesting thing about this book is that the author is not a cultural critic. He is a marketing uh, man. Uh, he's a partner in a marketing firm, and he says, embrace this, right? Stop talking about the actual physical um, characteristics of your product and develop a mythology yeah. around it, right? You know, um, and Naomi Klein, as a cultural critic, talks about the same sort of thing, that, um, that uh, these super brands have kind of taken flight from material reality. So it's really not materialism at all, it's this kind of substitute um, metaphysics, it's the substitute spirituality, it's these, these kind of transcendent aspirations that get attached uh, to these products. I, I show my students um, the evolution of uh, shoe advertising mm -hmm. over the course of the 20th century. And the first thing I show them is an advertisement for Regal Shoes from 1909. And it's several paragraphs of dense text with a picture of a shoe. And it's all about the manufacturing process. They've developed a new kind of last that allows you to take the shoe out um, without getting wrinkling around the top. And, and all of this kind of detailed explanation about the virtues of the process and the product. Um, by mid-century then, um, the, the product doesn't really matter anymore. What matters is associating the product with certain other kinds of aspirations. So the second advertisement is from 1972, and it's a picture of a naked woman lying on the floor admiring a man's shoe, mm. and it says, keep her where she belongs. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, and so now uh -huh. you've got the shoe associated with these pathetic male fantasies of sex and domination and so on. Um, that was for a, a shoe company from uh, Milwaukee. 
And then more recently from, from 2010, um, you've got a, a, a black square and it just says in white lettering, write the future. And there's the, just the Nike swoosh. So there's no shoe pictured. There's no mention of shoes at all, really. Um, what it's become then is this aspiration to kind of transcend the, you know, the, the world and write the future, become the author of the future and all this kind of ridiculous thing. And so the shoe has kind of disappeared entirely into the gaseous ether of these kind of transcendent aspirations. Uh, and, and so that's a, a, a lot of what, um, what has gone on. And there's actually some empirical research that shows that brands have become substitutes for traditional, uh, what's considered religion. Uh, so there was a study done by a team of uh, Israeli and American uh, uh, researchers which shows that uh, the, the article is published in Marketing Science uh, Journal, and it's called Brands, the Opiate of the Masses. Mm -hmm. And they show that um, uh, through four separate studies, that the more people are attached to brands, the less they're attached to traditional religions like Christianity and Judaism, mm -hmm. and, and vice versa. The more attached they are to Christianity and Judaism and so on the less uh, they're attached to uh, brands. Mm. And so the way you describe the process of ordering something from Amazon Prime and it arriving, like, you know, it makes you think that there is something, it does feel like something transcendent is happening because I see all of these kind of infinite possibilities of fulfillment and they market themselves that way as like these fulfillment centers. And then I don't see who's doing it or how it's happening, but somehow, this object arrives on my front door and then I'm fulfilled, supposedly. So, right. but then you also mentioned in the beginning of the article though, that what it takes for that to happen, I mean, is pretty problematic that at a lot of these so-called fulfillment centers, like workers are being mistreated and ultimately like you lose this kind of human relationship with the, the product, with the, the thing that we're consuming. So considering that this is the case, is it morally problematic for someone to participate in this, to, to be supporting Amazon Prime? How do you answer that question? Yeah, I mean, everything is arranged so that we don't see this as a moral act at all, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, all we see is the kind of magic, right? So the, you know, Weber talked about disenchantment. It's, it's not at all disenchanted, right? There's, an, there's this is an incredible enchantment of going online and seeing all these beautiful things. And then you click and abracadabra, it just appears on your doorstep uh, like magic, right? Um, often at fantastically cheap uh, prices. Um, and that's all you see, right? So you don't see anything that might disturb your conscience. And it's all arranged very carefully so that you don't, right? So the process of um, globalization uh, just removes the manufacturing process uh, to an entirely different world. It's just over there on the other side uh, of the world. We don't see the pollution. We don't see the, you know, young Thai girls of 14 years old working 12 hours a day um, for, you know, 30 cents an hour. Um, we just don't see any of that kind of stuff. We don't know that the average garment worker in Sri Lanka makes $54 a month. Wow. Right. Which is which is really just uh, astonishing. But all of that is just kind of removed from our consciousness. And then the product comes to the U.S. and these fulfillment centers. Um, we don't generally see what's what's going on uh, in them. Uh, the New York Times did a, a, a report just a few weeks ago um, where they talk about the turnover in uh, Amazon fulfillment centers 
is intentional. I mean, it's very high. It's twice the national average. It's in in some fulfillment centers, it's 150% per year wow. uh, turnover. And Jeff Bezos uh, designed it that way. Um, he thought that people got lazy uh, if they stayed in the same job for too long. And so you want to kind of keep uh, keep people moving. And, and they are um, oftentimes people are fired by algorithms, by r- robots. Uh, and so, um, uh, the, the article was, was all about how even the, the process of human resources has, got, has become automated and the, every, every movement of the workers in these uh, fulfillment centers is monitored uh, and rationalized. So the, the opposite uh, of the kind of magic and enchantment is this intensely rationalized process where every movement of the workers is monitored and you know, you, you, your handheld device says you've got 14 seconds to go over to aisle four and get this product out of bin number 37. And, and, and your pick rate is, is being monitored and, and all of that kind of stuff. So, but all of that, of course, is, um, is just invisible uh, to us. So um, in 2020, uh, Jeff Bezos's net worth increased by $67 billion, with, so $183 million a day. Um, and the average, according to Amazon uh, file, uh, court filings in March of 2020, uh, same year, uh, the median uh, salary for a warehouse worker was $28,800. Uh, that's the median. So meaning half of the warehouse workers are making less than that, while Jeff Bezos is making $183 million a day. So th- there's this kind of intensely uh, exploitative um, process that's going on that we just don't see, right? I mean, increasingly more people uh, are becoming conscious of it and seeing it, uh, but it's designed so that we don't see it. You just fall in love with the product, you click on it, and it appears on your doorstep. Um, so the first process in, in developing a moral compass, it seems to me, is just seeing uh, what's going on, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when Jesus is talking about the, the final judgment in Matthew 25, uh, the people uh, that are welcomed into the kingdom of heaven uh, say, Lord, when did we see you uh, hungry and thirsty and naked and in prison and so on? And he says, whenever you did this to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did this to me. But the whole question is seeing, right? When, mm-hmm. when did we see you uh, uh, this way? And it's, it, he's, Christ is inviting us to kind of see Christ in other people. And so it's this, the, one of the first acts of having a moral life is just seeing, right? Seeing what's going on, seeing other people, uh, especially. And our whole economy is designed so that we don't see uh, people in, uh, in the process. All we see are products. Uh, and so I, I think this is a, I mean, it's a moral issue. It's an intensely moral issue. It may be the, um, the, the, the most important moral issue um, that, that we have uh, before us today. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I don't want to shy away from that and just dismiss it and say, well, you know, what can you do? Because on one hand, I think there's the question of the treatment of the workers, but then it's also, I think, for our own well-being as consumers or buyers, because I see for me that the the prospect of using Amazon Prime to buy something that I need, it totally cuts out the kind of human dimension of, of obtaining goods, you know, because you're, as you said, like, you don't see who's making it, you don't see anything of the process, you don't have a relationship with them. Um, it totally removes the level of risk. So like I can just sit in my bed and click a button without interacting with anyone. And that's like super comfortable. But again, it's a question of like, does this really fulfill me? Is this 
make my my uh, experience of using this product more meaningful? The answer is no. So I think on, on the other hand, like we have to think about ourselves. But the problem is so many of us are, we've gotten very comfortable with this. And I see for me, like if I know I need to buy something and I don't, I'm not going to use Prime, then I have to actually drive out to a store and I have to arrange with my schedule to go when I'm not working and while the store is open and what if they don't have it or what if I need to return it? And then I have to interact with people. And it's like, it's easier said than done. Oh, it so is. What do you do then? Like, how do we reaccustom ourselves to like having a more human experience of buying products? Right. And that's a, that's a great question. I mean, um, certainly um, there are times when you've got to order something online. It's just not available uh, locally. I still try to avoid Amazon and just get it directly from the manufacturer or something. Um, uh, so there, I, I mean, it, uh, I'm not asking for perfection. Um, and it is, I mean, the, the point you bring up is, is really important because you can build a morality and a moral life on guilt, uh, but that'll only get you so far, right? Guilt is good. Guilt is important, right? There are things that people ought to feel guilty about, you know, if people are, you know, being exploited or subject to racism or well, you know the all, all of the, the the different things that people should feel uh, a sense of guilt uh, about but ultimately you can only get so far uh, building a morality on guilt and you have to ultimately build it on joy right and so this is what i think pope francis is kind of so good at calling us towards he he, he hardly ever talks about the economy without calling it idolatrous right Mm -hmm. um, and he can be very harsh in his critiques, but ultimately he's calling us to a sense of joy and reconnecting with the earth and with other people and with God uh, in a way that, that brings us joy, right? Evangelii Gaudium, right? The, the joy of the gospel. Uh, Wendell Berry has an essay called The Joy of Sales Resistance, right? It's not about um, uh, feeling bad about things and kind of denying yourself a certain level of pleasure. It's about reconnecting with the physical world around you. It's about coming down. Uh, it's about the pleasure of going to the farmer's market and meeting the farmer and knowing, you know, having that, that good sense that you're participating in a sane economy that is contributing to the well-being of the earth and the well-being of the farmer and the farmer's family. And it's chatting with them about how their chickens are doing and um, all, of, all of that kinds of thing, you know, just little sorts of things that bring uh, people joy and, and reconnection. Uh, and, and not every economic transaction is going to be that uh, joyful. Um, but when you begin to examine your economic life, your life as a, a consumer and as a producer uh, in, in this light and you begin to kind of make changes, I think it brings a, a, a real sense of uh, well-being that uh, you can't get just by trying to ignore what's going on and, um, and just being subject to um, the way things are, right? That's one of, the, one of the greatest heresies and problems is the assumption that the way things are is just the way things have to be. You know, we, t we, we hear about market forces all the time. You know, well, that's just the way it is. People need to manufacture things as cheaply as they can because people wanna buy things as cheaply as they can. And if the workers get screwed in the process, there's just, what can you do about it? There's just market forces. And so we're constantly being told that it's just the way it is and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and I think kind of reclaiming a sense that it's not just the way it is, that it's not what we're fated to, that we do have choices, that we can uh, do things another way is very liberating and and joy joy giving 
I don't know. I mean, to be honest, sometimes it feels like there are so many forces conspiring against this. Like there's so many factors that contribute to like the depersonalization of just the process of buying, consuming, because yeah, it's like, I would like to go and buy things from someone who I know and who I have a relationship with, but it just feels like the way life is ordered now, the way society is ordered is just not conducive to that. So it's, I just feel like it's very easy to feel like this is all futile and like we can try to resist, but I don't know. Like, what do you do with that sense of, I guess, despair or futility? Um, you don't give in to it, mm. right? Um, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things conspiring uh, against us, right? But that's the ultimate victory is... To, to instill in the ultimate victory of the forces that are conspiring is to get people to think that there is no alternative, right? There is no other kind of economy possible. It's just the way it is and it's inevitable and there's nothing that can be done about it. Uh, and so even simple and small acts of resistance, I think are, um, are, are really important uh, in reclaiming the narrative that the things, things are not just the way they are, right? And I think this is, this is an imperative. If you're a Christian, this is not optional. Hope is not optional. Hope is an imperative, right? It's one of the theological virtues and it's, it's there in the Genesis story, right? The fall is, a statement of tremendous hope, right? Because the fact that there is a fall from grace means that the way things originally are and the way things really are is good. And uh, <clears throat> evil is a kind of falling away uh, from that, as opposed to the Babylonian creation story, which says things are just messed up from the get go mm -hmm. and there's nothing you can do about it, right? And so um that's that's an imperative of our faith i think is to uh is to reach out in ways uh small and great uh, uh to to make things differently so i'm not just talking about people with the leisure and the money to you know buy organic because i know a lot of people can't do that but i'm talking about structural things as well supporting uh, unions for example, I mean, Amazon has been very good at crushing every attempt to bring unions into their warehouses. Uh, and I think that's a problem, right? But so, the, so some of these kind of structural changes that can be made uh, are important for Christians to be involved in too. It's not just a matter of, uh, I've been talking about it at the level of the consumer, but I think there's, there are much larger uh, changes that can, can be made as well. Yeah, and I, I think going back to this imperative of hope is that as much as, yeah, like these external forces may be conspiring against us, I do think there's this invitation to a kind of personal change or conversion because like when I, in the moments where I said, you know, I could buy this, this book off of Prime or I could go to the local used bookstore I know that, yeah, like there is a risk implied because I do have to get out of bed. I don't know if they have the book I want. What if the, the person working at the store is crabby? But like when you decide like, okay, I'm going to take this risk. I don't know. Like as much as yes, it is inconvenient. I find that when I go with a kind of open mind or like some level of receptivity, I find myself surprised because yeah, maybe they don't have the book I want, but then I see something else or I run into somebody who I would not have if I were sitting in bed using Prime. So it's like, as much as yes, it is more challenging and riskier. There's, if we're open, perhaps there's something we're going to discover. Perhaps there's something more fulfilling that we'll find. But we like we have to do that personal kind of work of opening ourselves to the more than what we calculate, you know. Right. I think that's right. I mean, life life is inconvenient, right? Um, it is. Yeah. Life is messy, right? You know, it's like Pope Francis is calling us to you know get the smell of the sheep, 
go out into the streets and make a mess of things, he says, you know. Get your hands and, dirty. What's that? Get your hands dirty. Get your hands dirty, yeah. right? Um, personal contact, right? Um, uh, personalism. This is something that John Paul II uh, emphasized as well, right? Personalism means actually having encounters with other people as persons and not just as means uh, to an end. And there's lots of ways uh, of doing that, but it requires kind of resisting this tendency of our present economy to depersonalize uh, relationships so that relationships are reduced to relationships with things and not uh, relationships with people. Mm. So I think we can end on this more hopeful note that as much as yes, like mm, abstaining from using companies like Amazon, it's more inconvenient, it's more frustrating. There's something to be gained here. There's something beyond, again, beyond what our measurements are beyond, our, beyond our calculations that we can find. So thanks for the conversation. This was fun. Oh, thank you, Stephen. This was great fun. Awesome. I hope to do it again. Yeah, me too. All right.